the 25th hour radio show. Dr. Shostak, if you don't mind, would you give our listeners a little bit of info about yourself? What first got you interested in the career field that you're in, you know, that eventually set the tone for you to get your Ph.D. in astrophysics? Well, I was uh, interested in astronomy from a very early age, uh, certainly from the age of eight that I can recall. <laughs> Anything before that is a little more difficult <laughs> to recall. But uh, I remember going through books uh, in my parents' house, and, and they had a bunch of atlases. I was very keen on maps at the time. Still am, actually. And, uh, you know, the atlases frequently would have drawings of solar system, the solar system, uh, in the back. And uh, I asked my parents what the heck those things were. My mom said, those are planets, which, of course, merely prompted a second question, what's a planet? <laughs> but I got interested, and by age 10, 11, I had already built a telescope and was looking at things. So, you know, the interest in astronomy goes back a long way. The interest in aliens goes back almost as far, because I saw a lot of bad movies when I was a kid. <laughs> so let's fast forward to the present day. You know, at the moment, you're the senior astronomer and the director of SETI, and a lot of people might not know there is actually a program in place like SETI. And for those people who might not know that, what exactly, you know, is SETI? Well, the SETI Institute is where I work, and that's a nonprofit research uh, organization here in the Silicon Valley of California, just south of San Francisco. And the scientists here are interested in the question of life and space in general. Most of the people down the hall here from where I'm speaking to you are uh, looking for life in our backyard, if you will, uh, in, uh, you know, on this I don't know, underneath the sands of Mars, there are something like five moons of Jupiter and Saturn that might conceivably have life. Uh, so they're interested in life nearby that's probably going to be microscopic. Now, there's also the project known as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, to look for life that isn't microscopic, for life that's uh, intelligent. And that's the group that I'm the director for. So uh, we're, we're using uh, antennas here in Northern California, something called the Allen Telescope Array, mm -hmm. and we do just what Jody Foster did in the movie Contact. We point these antennas in the directions of nearby stars, hoping to pick up a signal that would tell us that there's somebody out there at least clever enough to build a radio transmitter. Mm -hmm. so, so what exactly are the steps one might take to prove the existence of an intelligent life form? What are you looking for, or, you know, or better yet, what are you listening for? Well, we just look for a narrowband signal that's coming from the, the stars, if you will. Narrow band means that it's at one spot on the radio dial. It's not spread all over the dial the way uh, uh, the radio signal from a pulsar or the static coming from Jupiter or the sun would be. It's coming from one spot on the sky that's moving uh, the same way the stars move around the Earth because of the Earth's rotation. And that's, uh, that's narrow band. That's at one spot on the dial. And that's something that only a transmitter can make. So that's the indication. Have you ever had an instance where you picked up something that could possibly be from an intelligent life form? Well, we pick up signals all the time. Roughly every 10 seconds you get some sort of signal mm -hmm. because, after all, we have big antennas and we're monitoring tens of millions of uh, radio channels at once, right? So that's a pretty big receiver. And as a consequence, uh, we pick up signals. But these signals have all been due to telecommunication satellites, uh, research satellites, radars down at the local airport, whatever man-made interference, if you will. So, so far, we haven't picked up E.T. You know, I can turn on my TV about any given time during the day and find something on about, you know, UFOs. Do you personally think we've been visited in an earlier time in our history, you know, as ancient astronaut theorists suggest? Well, I mean, they, they talk about ancient astronauts, and what they're really talking about is maybe the Egyptians, maybe the Greeks, the Romans. You know, that's that's ancient to you and me, but that's not at all ancient when it comes to history of life on Earth, that's, that's yesterday, that's all that is, mm -hmm. and I honestly don't think that the, if they had been visited, the evidence would be a lot better than anything I've seen on these TV shows. Uh, I don't think we're being visited today either, a lot of people do, a third of the population seems to believe that, but I think that if it were true, the evidence would, A, be much, much better, and beyond that, you'd have a lot of people working on that problem, <laughs> which, you don't, which you don't have, so uh, that, that is merely a testament to how good the evidence is, I'm afraid. So how long is it going to be before we get that, you know, that advancement in technology to where it's not so much being lucky, you know, to hear a signal as if, you know, if it was out there, you know, we're going to hear it? 
Well, I mean, I'll if we ever get to that point. That depends on how many societies are out there. And, of course, it could be zero. It could be we're the smartest things in the galaxy. That would uh, stun me. I don't think that's <laughs> true. But, you know, it, it, I mean, it can't be ruled out, at least not on the basis of observations yet. But, um, you know, that doesn't mean, I mean, even if there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of societies broadcasting, it doesn't mean that it's trivial to pick up those signals. You have to have a very big antenna. You have to point it in the right direction and so forth. And uh, so that, that's a problem. In, in particular, it's a problem simply because there's very little money to do this. There's no federal funding for it. It's all private donations. So it's a rather small-scale effort. You know, I watch a lot of TV, right? I like science fiction films. I love a good conspiracy theory, just like the next guy. What happens when you finally get that signal? Is there a protocol on how you release that information? I mean, is Big Brother going to come in and take over and make everything hush-hush? How does that work? Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people assume that, and they say, "Oh, you know, you keep it quiet, or the the federal government wouldn't let you reveal the news because the public couldn't handle it, stuff like that." And that's all kind of it's kind of amusing, but it's not true. I mean, we've <laughs> we've had some false alarms, and when you get a false, we had a false alarm. It's been a while now, like fifteen years or something, no more, uh, more like eighteen years ago. A very convincing false alarm. Even we thought, well, this might be the big one. And I kept waiting for the men in black to show up. I, I always wanted to have a conversation with Will Smith about some of his acting. And, uh, you know, but they didn't. They didn't. Nobody was interested. <laughs> uh, the, the, the media were interested. The New York Times did call, but the, the government was not at all interested. There is a protocol. All it says is be sure to uh, check the signal to make sure you're not being fooled because that, that is an issue. With so much interference, it's very easy to mistake uh, a signal being produced by humans for one being produced by aliens. So you, you want to make sure that, you know, what you found is for real. And then you just let everybody know. I mean, that's basically what it is. It also says don't broadcast anything back without first, you know, asking the world's opinion about that. But that's a different thing. There's no hurry to run to the microphone if these guys are hundreds of light years away. So how long is it going to be before, you know, you think we're going to hear something? Well, nobody knows, but I bet everybody a cup of... Uh, of coffee that will do it in the next two decades. But if the funding continues, and that, that's a big if, but if the funding continues and if we, you know, continue to improve the equipment, then in the next two decades we will have looked at about a million star systems. And personally, I think that that's about the right number to, uh, to give you some assurance that I won't have to buy those cups of coffee <laughs> and we'll actually find ET. Absolutely. So before we start to wrap this up, I want to make sure I get this out there. Are you still doing your own radio show? Uh, we are, yes. Big Picture Science. Big so what's, picture what's science. that about? When does it broadcast? Well, it's broadcast on a lot of stations, and they each keep their own schedule. We produce the show, and then they, they transmit it when they want. But you can find it on the web. That's maybe the easiest thing to do. Just look up Big Picture Science, the radio show. And uh, it's about all science, actually, uh, just about everything. Science and technology, a lot of it having to do, of course, with uh, life and space, but actually it's mostly not about that. It's about other areas of science, uh, neuroscience, um, you know, can we cure death? So a lot of that. And then once a month we do what's called skeptic kick, where we uh, take on something like Bigfoot or whatever, and we look at it through the lens of science and, you know, ask ourselves, is there any truth to this or not? So what about the website, social media for yourself? Anything you can direct people to to get more information about yourself and SETI? Oh, they can just look up my name. That's a good thing. Or else go to SETI.org. That's always good. So one last question, Dr. Shostak. What's your favorite alien movie of all time? Uh, War of the Worlds, the first one. <laughs> the it's original, like a, a huh? Disappointing. Yeah. yeah, the first one had a certain terror. It's, it's kind of it's, it's kind of clunky looking these days because, of course, it was all done with, you know, wires and models and stuff like that. But there was uh, the director... Uh, had a sense for what is truly terrifying, and I thought that that was pretty good myself. Well, Dr. Shostak, thank you so much for spending a few minutes uh, with me today. I think what you're doing is absolutely fascinating, and uh, good luck in your search. Thanks very much, Rob. Radio Show.